Um, oops, one more piece. So I'm going to start where we stopped, which is by talking about the David and Sandstrom old age security motive fertility model. I want to go back and give you some context for the little exercise that we did in class on Tuesday where we were brainstorming various aspects of modeling fertility. So when you go about critiquing a model, so you are, uh, you've got somebody's argument and you want to critique that argument, you can critique the model. One way of critiquing the model is before you even start reading the work to figure out what's the author's question and then just start from there and start brainstorming. So the author's question is what determines the decline in fertility or the regional pattern in fertility? And so you can start with a big thing. What are the possible goals that people might be trying to achieve? So that's why we started with what are the goals? I'm going to show our list in just a minute. Some of the things that we had on the goals list were truly goals. Some of them were not. Um, some of them I didn't even put on the list, and some of them we put on the list, and they're not really in the context of goals. So the first thing is what I think of as a big thing. So it does the author, not does the author, before you even start reading the article, to so just sit back and brainstorm, either with friends or with yourself, and think, okay, what kind of goals might people be trying to achieve as they're determining fertility, the number of children? Medium think, I broke this into big, medium, and small. Think Goldilocks. Um, medium think is given some goal. So people are trying to have some target bequest. People are trying to provide for security in their old age. People are trying to spread their religion, something along those lines. Given a goal, Two questions you can brainstorm. One, what variables, typically things that we can measure, so variables or factors or whatever word you want to put in there, might affect behavior. And that's where we came up with a list of income and, and uh, costs of raising children and that sort of a thing. And related to that is, are there other things that aren't easily measurable? Are there constraints such as laws? Are there institutions? Uh, are there other things along these lines? So things that may matter to, in this case, fertility, but that aren't variables in the sense that some people have income of X and some people have income of X plus seven and some people have income of X plus 14, but are um, not easily measured. Like, is there a law that says you can only have one child? Would be a zero one, or what we call a dummy variable, an indicator variable. And then small thing, which we're not going to do in this class, is are the econometrics, ooh, I said is, well, is or are, um, is the econometrics, are the econometrics done properly? We're not gonna worry in this class about whether the econometrics are done properly because the only prerequisite for this course is econ one. So if the prerequisite for this course was Econ 140 or 141, we would spend more time talking about, has the author used the right econometric test? Is OLS the right thing to do here? Have they controlled for the types of errors? Is there heteroscedasticity and all that kind of good stuff? We're not going to do that in this class. We're just going to skip over that question altogether because some of you have had econometrics, some have not. It's not a prerequisite for the course. So I taught you the extent of econometrics you need, which is to understand signs and statistical significance. That's what you're working on in the section exercise this week. And it's also what you'll work on on the problem set. So we got a whole lot of different pieces of paper, by the way, going around. One is you get emailed a pre-section exercise or a link to a pre-section exercise. So that's the piece that you're doing before you go to section and you're taking it into section and you get credit for, for having done that in section. The second piece of paper that you get, which we make copies of, right, is in section, you get a section exercise. So that's the work, the group work that you do in section to help solidify some concepts. Um, and answers to those get posted after all sections have done the exercise, which is Fridays, I think, typically. Um, and we're trying to figure out whether those things get posted just on your section B-space site or on the course B-space site. Doesn't really matter. Check one, check the other, you'll find it, it'll be there. And then the third thing is what you received as you walk in today, which is the problem set. The first two are graded for completion. The problem sets are graded for accuracy. So the problem sets your third chance now to demonstrate your understanding of how this reading of econometric results works. And that one's going to be graded for accuracy. So that one's graded out of 10 points, so two points for each question. Um, the level of econometrics that we're expecting, to link this back into the bullet that's on the board, the level of econometrics that we're expecting is simply, what's the sign of the coefficient? Is it statistically significant? Does it have meaning? We're not worried about all of the niceties that you learn in 140-141. If you want to play that game, that's great. It's fabulous. It will make you much more employable. It's just not this course, because it's not a prerequisite for this course. Okay. So we're going to focus mostly on the big think and the medium think ways of critiquing arguments. So one way to go about critiquing somebody's argument is before you even read the article is the brainstorm. And that's what we did on Tuesday. We brainstormed goals and we brainstormed variables. A second way to go about critiquing an argument is as you're reading, you read a sentence and you say to yourself, yeah, okay, but what if instead, dot, dot, dot. If you haven't already brainstormed, if you haven't already sat back and thought about what are the goals people might have, what are the variables that might matter, what are the constraints people might face, if you haven't already done that brainstorming, it can be harder to come up with the, yeah, but what ifs. Because you're really embedded in the author's argument. If the author's a good writer, they're taking you along and, think, and you're thinking, this makes a lot of sense, this makes a lot of sense, this makes a lot of sense, this makes a lot of sense. And it's harder when you're in that context of reading somebody's work, particularly if it's well written, to come up with the ways in which you might critique. So that's why I think it's really useful to start with the brainstorming like we did on Tuesday. To start with the, what are the possible goals people might be trying to achieve and what are the possible uh, variables that might matter. Um, we have a whole lot to do today. We've got four topics, including this fertility topic. And so we've got an exercise we're going to do when we come to immigration, but we're going to move along in a nice fast clip today. I hope. We'll see. It's all up to me. I have to limit my stories. All right, so fertility. So when we talked about fertility on Tuesday, and we brainstormed possible goals. This is the list that we came up with. So this is the slide from Tuesday of the possible goals that we came up with. Now, some of these, as it turns out, are not goals. Some of them were things that uh, would matter to how many. So for instance, uh, time was one of the things that we bracketed. So time, the time, the, the amount of time it takes to raise a child or the amount of time that you have available to raise a child, that's going to determine how many children you have. But it's not a goal. It's not, I'm going to have children because it takes time to raise them? No. So the goal is I'm going to have children because dot dot dot. I'm going to have children because of religious reasons. That would be a goal. I'm going to have children because I need kids to help me on the farm. That would be a goal. I'm going to have children because I want somebody to take care of me when I'm an old woman. That would be a goal. Um, I'm going to have children because uh, I need somebody to pass on the family wealth to. That would be a goal. I'm going to have children because I want to have a son. It's not a goal. It might determine how many children you have, but why do you want to have a son? I want to have children because I want to have a son because a son will take care of me in my old age, or I want to have children because I want to have a son because a son will take over the family farm. So having a son turns out not to be a goal, but it's going to be one of those things that determines how many. So once people decide yes, we're going to have children because we want children in order to fill in the blank. Then having a son, if the goal is, yes, we got somebody to take over the farm, it has to be a son, you can't leave the farm to a, a daughter, then, the, then you're going to keep going until you have a son. Companionship, that's the goal. I want to have children because I want somebody to be my companion, I'm an old woman. Um, uh, social pressure, I want to have children because my parents are on my back and if it's the only way to shut them up, I'll have a kid. Bad reason, just saying. Not a good reason, but anyway, could be. Um, phones, thank you. All right, then we came up with a series of variables. Some of these variables will be relevant to some goals, but not to others. So I didn't say, okay, let's choose one of these goals off of our list, and let's, let's then come up with the variables that would influence the number of children. I said, let
and, and so on. So we came up with these various variables. Then what we do is we keep these things in the back of our head as we think about the arguments that are offered by the authors. So Bill Easton a long time ago offered an argument that the reason people have children is because they want to pass on their wealth to the next generation. But they want to pass on an amount of wealth that is at least equal to some viable, say, farm share. And so Bill Easterlin's argument, which was not on this slide, but was on the slides of the day, Bill Easterlin's argument was that the more expensive farmland becomes, the fewer children people will have, because their goal is to pass on a farm that's a viable size. And as farmland becomes more expensive, it's more expensive to leave a farm to a child, to bequeath a farm to a child, uh, and that will raise the cost and therefore lead to a decrease in the number of children. In all of this, embedded behind it, implicit in all of this, is some sort of cost-benefit analysis. So we didn't get to the exercise yesterday or Tuesday that was what are the behavioral assumptions. But both the Easterlin model and the David Sunster model, and most of the models that we could come up with, are ultimately some sort of cost-benefit analysis. What are the costs of having children? What are the benefits of having children? And finding the number of children that maximizes the net benefit. So if the benefit increases at a decreasing rate with the number of children, or does the benefit increase linearly with the number of children? Does the benefit exist with one child and then you don't get any additional benefit from the second, third, fourth, and fifth child? Does the benefit decline once you get to six and you go on to seven or eight? So there's some benefit notion and there's some cost notion. The cost of having children, the higher the cost, higher cost is going to give us a smaller net benefit, lead to a smaller number of children. So behind all of this, that implicit behavioral assumption is that rational economic calculus, that people are going to maximize some measure of net benefit. For Easterland, they're doing it with the goal of bequeathing a viable farm to their children. David and Sundstrom say, nah, not so fast. One of the reasons David and Sundstrom said, nah, not so fast, was because Easterland, when he proposed his model, and all of his students also had their versions of it, they all said, this only applies to the Northeast, and the Midwest, it does not apply to the South. So Easterland explicitly said, the South is a slave culture, and my model that explains what's going on in New England, in the Mid-Atlantic states, and in the Midwest states, can't explain what's going on in the Southern states, because that's, that's where there's slavery. He didn't really have an explanation for why it wouldn't work because of slavery. He just sort of asserted that this is a model that won't explain a slave-based culture. Other economic historians said, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, if people are motivated by comparison, comparing costs and benefits, why would they be any less motivated by comparing costs and benefits in Alabama than they were in Pennsylvania? That if people are economically rational, uh, then people are economically rational, and they're comparing, they're comparing costs and benefits regardless of what state they happen to live in. And so that was one of the, the pushes that pushed David and Sundstrom, as well as others, to try to come up with an alternative model. Because implicit, there we are again, implicit assumption behind this stuff is that people are rational economic actors. Remember rational in the economic sense. Rational doesn't mean rational, however it's defined in Webster's Dictionary. Rational, when economists says people are rational, we mean they are deliberately taking actions to try to achieve whatever goal they have set. So if their goal is to maximize the net benefit, then they're going to take the action that they would allow them to achieve that goal. They're not going to deliberately hurt themselves and take an action that pulls them away from that goal. Okay. David Sundstrom posits that old age security is the motivation for having kids, that people have children so that there'll be somebody to take care of them in their old age. In this time, the old people were largely the moms because the, the, moms were, the women were likely to outlive the men. Uh, and so it's largely about old age security for the, the mothers. Oh my gosh, I've just gone through like eight pages of notes. Okay, um, what do they find? Their story is that fertility depends upon labor market opportunities and it goes like this. That parents engage in an implicit bargain with their children over who's going to care for the parents, which is largely mother, in her old age. Who's gonna take care of mama after daddy dies? And there is an implicit bargain that goes on between the parents. Implicit means people don't sit down around the dining room table and talk about this. There's an implicit bargain that goes on between the parents and the children over who's going to care for mama in her old age. When the, and part of this bargain is to say, Chris, if you take care of mama when she's old, I'll leave you the farm. So that, that yeah. So, so there you are. And you're thinking, you know, if I'm a good daughter or son, and I do well, and I take care of mom, and I help contribute to the farm, then when daddy dies, he's going to leave me the farm, and I will take mama in, and I'll take care of mama, and I get the farm. So the deal is, the stick, I suppose, is you take care of mama. The carrot is, but you get the farm. When there are labor market opportunities for the children, that increases the bargaining power of the children. Because now the children can say, yeah, I know you want me to stay here on the farm in the middle of nowhere where there is nothing to do but farm, thank you very much. But things are going up in Kansas City. They're building as high as they can go. It's a song. Anyway, there's a lot of labor market opportunities in Kansas City, and I'm not going to stay here on the farm. I'm going to go into Kansas City and make my life. And dad says, yes, but if you leave the farm and you leave us and you don't take care of your mother, then I won't give you a share, your share of the farm when I die. And you say, Papa, I'm on my way. I am going to Kansas City. Right? So the more the labor market opportunities present themselves, the more there's bargaining power on the part of the children to basically turn down this bargain, to say, I don't want the farm or any part of it. I've got a life plan for myself, and it has nothing to do with cows and sheep and hogs and manure. Thank you very much. I was coming up with a series of words that didn't start with M that they produce, which decreases this increased bargaining power on the part of the children, decreases the parents' return on their investment. So if you think about economically, what's the return on investment? So let's not think about kids for a minute. Let's think about a business owner buying a machine. When a business owner is trying to decide whether to buy a machine investment, they have to come up with some hunch as to the return from buying and using this machine. So they're going to buy a, oh, I don't know, let's say frozen yogurt machine. They're going to buy a frozen yogurt machine. They're going to use it over the life of the frozen yogurt machine to produce frozen yogurt. They're going to sell the frozen yogurt. And the additional revenue they get from buying and using that machine relative to the cost of running the machine, that gives them their return. And you can express it as based on the price of the machine and you get a rate of return. That gives them the return on the investment. The higher the return on investment, that is the more profit they get from buying any particular machine, then the rational economic actor someone behaving rationally in an economic sense, will purchase more machines because there's more profit. The lower the expected profit, that is the lower the expected return on that investment, the fewer machines businesses will purchase. Well, if we don't talk about frozen yogurt machines, but we talk about kids, and the return on the investment is the likelihood that the kid is going to stay and help take care of mom, or maybe not stay, maybe go into Kansas City, but promise to send back money to help take care of mom on a regular basis. You can do it through checks as well, you don't have to say. But if the likelihood that the kid is going to turn down this bargain to help take care of mom in exchange for the lights of Kansas City, I don't know where that sentence went, but as that likelihood of turning it down goes up, the return on the investment in children goes down, and that gets us fewer children. That's the David and Sunstrom argument. The David and Sunstrom argument is higher labor market opportunities mean that fewer children are willing to partake in this bargain where they take care of mom in exchange for some share of the estate, which means that the parents recognizing that the kids are going to grow up and go off to Kansas City aren't going to have
then it should be that the more labor market opportunities there are, the lower fertility is. That if we gather some data and look at some measure of labor market opportunities and compare that with fertility, we ought to have in areas where there's high labor market opportunities, there's low fertility. In areas where there's low labor market opportunities, there's high fertility. And notice it's independent of whether it's a slave culture or, free, or a non-slave culture. It's just assuming that people are responding to incentives. Also, while they're at it, they decided to check uh, Easterlin's hypothesis because Easterlin's hypothesis said that what would matter is the quantity of rural land that was available. And that as rural land became less and less available, people would have fewer children because it would cost more for the land. And so that's why in the regression results, which you got in the exercise we did last Thursday, was it also in the pre-section exercise? I got confused about what you did. You did Hannah's section exercise. And this was a pre-section, right? Okay, so this was a pre-section and also what we did in class on Thursday. So in this regression, we got two things going on. First, we've got this row, the rural land availability index. That's testing Easterlin's hypothesis. Is it a target request motive? If these coefficients on rural land availability had been statistically significant, that is, if there were little stars after those numbers, if those numbers had been statistically significant, that would have lended empirical support to Easterlin's hypothesis that the reason people have children is because they want to leave them a share of the farm, and that the more expensive it is to leave them a share of the farm, the smaller number of children they'll have. But are there stars on any of those coefficients? No. Every one of those coefficients in the red box is not statistically significant, which means that there's not empirical support. There's not support from the data for Easterlin's hypothesis of the target request motive. On the other hand, if we look instead at the variables that the old age security motive suggests would matter, which are these sec last two variables, the first one being the ratio of the non-ag to ag labor force, so that's some measure of the number of jobs, and the second being the ratio of wages non-ag to ag, those are the things that are measuring labor market opportunities. So we're measuring both some measure of the quantity of jobs, that's the first one, and the wages in those jobs, that's the second. And in that case, those variables, are they statistically significant, yes or no? Yep, because they have stars after them. You don't have to know any econometrics to look for stars. Right? All you need is stars. Those things have stars after them. They have negative signs, which is pretty cool, because it means the higher is the non-ag versus the ag labor force, that is the more labor market op opportunities there are off the farm, the lower is the child woman ratio, the lower is fertility. That's what this, whatever this is, one, two, three, fourth line tells us. The more off the farm jobs there are, the lower is fertility. The data is state by state. And the next one, the last line, looks at wages again, has a negative coefficient that's statistically significant. The bigger the pay gap between non-agricultural and agricultural wages, another measure of labor market opportunity, the bigger the pay gap, the lower fertility is in that state. The data are measured state by state. When David and Sundstrom did this work, this was, this was published 20 some years ago, the level of computer technology that we had, and the, it's basically it's all computers, the types of computers, the level of technology, the amount of memory, the speed of computers, didn't allow the kind of work that people do today. There's another article that I didn't assign that looks again at this particular question, and instead of looking at state-by-state -state data, it's work by Marianne Wanamaker, and it uses household-by-household -household data. Now, in 2013, we have computers, we have laptop computers that are faster and have greater memory than the humongous desktops that we had 20 years ago. And so now what people are doing is they're taking the records off of Ancestry.com, which is the website where a lot of detailed household-by-household -household information is found. They're taking records off of Ancestry.com. You can get census records off of their household-by-household. -household. You can get ships manifests off of theirs. So you can see person-by-person person who was on which ship that docked at Ellis Island uh, in any given year. And they're going through and they're matching those records. And so then they're able to, to look at, over the course of one particular woman's life, when does she have children and where is she living when she has those children, and look at for any particular individual, what are the labor market opportunities for those particular individuals and how does that impact their fertility, and are able with that fine level of household data, and then they have hundreds of thousands of data points instead of 50. With that fine level of data, finding this, this hypothesis is confirmed. That the greater the labor market opportunities, the lower is fertility. The greater labor market opportunities, the lower is fertility. Does that necessarily mean that they are motivated by security in their old age? Not necessarily. Ian. So maybe not be about the kids, it may be about the women. So it could be a measure of opportunity cost for the mothers as opposed to some opportunities for the children. So, so the data tell us that there is a story here that links labor market opportunities as measured by quantities and wages to fertility. It doesn't necessarily tell us that old age security is the only possible motive that's consistent with those data. Right. I have a blank sheet here. And I can put down, I'll take three. What are other things that we might critique or challenge about the David and Sundstrom article? What are assumptions? And those assumptions can be goal, variables that measure the goal, assumptions like what we were just doing in terms of uh, rationality, things that we have omitted, be they measurable or unmeasurable variables. What, what might you critique? What might you offer? Give me one. Um, Leah. Okay. Okay. So one thing we might critique is that the whole method, the whole, the whole argument, better, the whole argument assumes that the parents are rational economic actors, that they are undertaking actions to maximize their net benefit, where the net benefit is the difference between the expected benefits and the expected costs of having children, uh, and that they're not motivated by, for instance, altruism or other possibilities. Okay. Uh, Amol. Uh, 